welcome everyone um, to the Australian um, Institute for Health Innovations webinar series. Um, my name is Farah Magrabi um, and I'm a stream lead for uh, patient safety informatics research here um, at the Institute. Um, we'll get started in a moment. Um, in the meantime, while people are just joining us, um, I'll, I'll kind of just run through some housekeeping. So video, your video and sound won't be turned on. Um, we'll be recording the session and the recording will be shared after the event. Um, the chat function is off, but please um, do use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen, um, which is operational. And you can use this throughout um, to add questions. So let's um, start by first um, acknowledging um, the country. So on behalf of this gathering um, today, um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are joining the session and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I'd like to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with, uh, who are with us um, today as well. We have a great um, topic lined up, um, highlighting innovative research uh, to prevent patient harm. Um, I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Jason Edelman, who is joining us today all the way from New York. Um, Dr. Edelman is the Chief uh, Patient Safety Officer, um, Associate Chief Quality Officer, and as well as the Executive Director for Patient Safety Research at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and uh, the New York Presbyterian um, Hospital. Um, it's a very, very different context to us. Um, you know, Jason was just telling us um, they're looking after over 800 COVID patients in their hospital and their kids are still being homeschooled. So we're very, very, um, you know, grateful that you found time to find, to kind of participate and, and give our seminar in the midst of everything else that's happening. Um, so now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jason. Um, thank you. And um, good morning to all of you. Um, for me, it's um, seven o'clock at night in New York. Um, and uh, this is really um, my passion to talk about health IT safety and um, patient safety and research. Um, so it's a privilege to um, be speaking to you all today. Um, I have no disclosures. And um, I'm going to start with a case report of a true story. Um, Mrs. X, an 87-year-old female with a history of high blood pressure, COPD, and coronary artery disease, was admitted to a telemetry unit with a diagnosis of rapid atrial fibrillation. The day after admission, a medicine resident of first year accidentally placed an order for methadone 70 milligrams for Mrs. X. For those who don't know, methadone is a drug we give to heroin addicts to try to help them come off. Heroin is a very powerful narcotic. Um, so the medicine resident accidentally placed an order of methadone 70 milligrams for Mrs. X, which he meant to order for another patient. Both patients were on the resident's um, list in the electronic health record. A pharmacist signed off on the methadone order and later, th later that day, a nurse in training administered the medication. Experienced nurses know we don't um, really give methadone to elderly um, females, but this unfortunately was a nurse in training who wasn't as closely supervised as, as they should have been. Several hours later, Mrs. X was observed to be restless and complaining of being hot and nauseated. Shortly thereafter, Mrs. X was found unresponsive, pulseless, and with blue extremities. A code was called, she was intubated and transferred to the medical ICU. Um, this is a, a clipping that I found um, from the London Gazette, um, which forgive me for reading again, but I, I just, this clip is so good. I, I, can't help but include it in my talks. So the year there, if you see, is 1820, so exactly 200 years ago, having another patient of the same name in the hospital whose complaint was violent spasms and flatulence of the stomach, the prussic acid was by mistake administered to the wrong patient, a circumstance highly credible to the apothecary and by no means uncommon in London hospitals. And so here we are 200 years later, and um, I can tell you that placing orders on the wrong patient is by no means uncommon in New York hospitals. There have been um, reports of um, wrong patient errors um, in different venues. In the United States, the Institute of Safe Medication Practice, ISMP, is sort of the leader of medication safety. And um, several years back, they reported a case of a patient dying um, 
from a, a wrong patient error in the emergency room. Um, when it comes to why people place orders, electronic orders on the wrong patient, um, before I started doing my research, the leading theory was um, what they call juxtaposition errors. The idea being that when there's a list of patients and a provider or an orderer means to click on one patient, they accidentally click on the patient just above or below, thus a juxtaposition error. Now, I wanted to get a sense of how often um, these errors were happening. Um, I, I really wanted to put in interventions to try to prevent them. Um, but first, just to get a sense of um, what other hospitals were experiencing. And the only place that I could really find that quantify these errors is called the MedMarks database. And here I'm sharing um, a report that they had from 120 facilitate, uh, facilities, hospitals, where the mean number of wrong patient errors entered was nine in one year. Now, there's lots of ways to detect errors. Um, you can detect errors through chart review, through voluntary reported errors, surveys and focus groups. The, the um, reason why they felt um, juxtaposition was the reason for wrong patient errors was based on focus groups. Patients can report natural language processing, ICD-10 codes, and, and other, uh, other mechanisms. The final one I have on the list is automated detection of errors, and that's what I'm about to talk to you about, the automated detection of wrong patient errors. Um, with our experience with wrong patient errors that I know many hospitals have had, we wanted to study some interventions for preventing them, but we wanted to then evaluate um, the effectiveness of these interventions. And to understand the effectiveness, we needed a way to measure the errors. And we didn't think voluntary reporting would be a great mechanism given there was an average of nine a year. And so we thought maybe we could make an automated detection for identifying wrong patient errors. And so we came up with this model. The way it works is if, um, imagine I as a physician, I order for patient A, I order a left hip x-ray, an antibiotic like penicillin and a catheter. And a few minutes after I place those orders for patient A, I cancel them. And then I place the exact same left hip x-ray, penicillin, and catheter on patient B. The original programmer I worked with used to call it the oops query, like, oops, I'm on the wrong patient. But to give it a more professional sounding name, we call it the retract and reorder measure. It's retracted and reordered. So it turns out that we found 6,885 retract and reorder events in one year. We set up a mechanism to assess, are these actually wrong patient errors, these retract and reorder events? Um, so this is sort of a, a schema of how it works where um, in our environment, um, we make a real-time replicate of our um, production database. So what the providers are using, we make a copy of it in real time so that we can do queries and work off it without disrupting patient care. The name of our replicate is called Jupiter. And every 30 minutes we query Jupiter for a retract and reorder event. If we find one, we um, um, send an email to some research coordinators um, and in it is a link to a survey. We use a tool called Qualtrics. It's like SurveyMonkey, if you're familiar with that. Um, and in it, we populate the information about the two patients involved in the wrong patient error and the name of the provider that placed the orders, canceled them and reordered them. What was the drugs or orders? And what, even what's the contact information for the provider? And then a research coordinator with IRB approval will call that provider and assess if, in fact, it was a wrong patient order. We learned it's best not to um, straight out say, did you make a wrong patient error? But instead, we ask them why they placed the first order or orders, why they canceled them, and then why they ordered on the next patient. And usually, we'll, we'll get to that it was a wrong patient error. <clears throat> and for those that um, uh, admit that it was a wrong patient error, we have follow-up questions to assess why they actually made the error, what led to the error. And so we called 236 people and 170 um, uh, confirmed it was a wrong patient error, which is 76.2%. So if you correct those 6,885 retract and reorder events, 
we found in one year 5,246 wrong patient orders, which translates to 14 a day in the hospital. In one year, one out of six providers placed an order on the wrong patient. And for every 37 patients admitted to the hospital, um, at least one has an order or so, uh, several orders placed on them for a short period of time anyway, that before they're caught and, and, and corrected. And so if you recall, I said just a moment ago that before my research, the most I could find was an average of nine wrong patient errors. We have 5,000. Um, and this is important because it allows us to study interventions for preventing them and have an outcome measure. Um, and these are like the real deer. They don't require voluntary reporting. There's no bias of uh, from reporting. It doesn't require chart review. Um, people, when they find themselves placing an order on the wrong patient, they're not going to let those orders live on. They're going to correct them and, and place them on the right patient. And so we see who does it, when it happens at night, the weekends, and there's many ways to analyze these errors. They're all near miss errors, so they never reach the patient. Um, but in the patient safety world, we believe that um, errors that are sort of caught by the grace of God and, and don't reach the patient, self-caught is not the mechanism safety that we're looking for. And when they're not self-caught, that's when they break through and cause harm. And that the mechanisms are basically the same. It's just if you're lucky enough that your provider catches it or not. So besides like now having a, a, a reliable measure with a good number of wrong patient errors that we can use to study interventions, as I mentioned, for those that had um, true positive wrong patient errors, we had the opportunity to ask them why they made the error. And again, we're talking to people 30 to 40 minutes after they make the error. So I'm the chief patient safety officer at my hospital. I chair all the root cause analyses here. Very often when an error happens, I'm talking to people days after they make an error. In this case, it's minutes after. So if somebody made a wrong patient error because they were distracted mentally and thinking of their sick child at home, we're speaking to them in, in such a short order that we can capture those kind of sentiments. And so I mentioned that prior to my research, the main theory why people place orders on the wrong patient is juxtaposition errors, two names, one on top of the other, and um, they mean to click on one and inadvertently click on the other. When we call people, only 10% said it was juxtaposition. 80% had a different reason why these errors happen. What we heard over and over again was it was actually interruption. Um, what we heard is that, um, imagine I'm admitting patient A to full admission. I'm going to order his diet, his lab test, his imaging test, his medications, his exercise, everything, write all the notes. I'm going to spend an hour doing this admission. And somewhere in the midst of placing his admitting orders, I get a call that patient B um, is in pain. Can I order Percocet? So I switch to patient B. I order the Percocet. And right then, I get interrupted, and I have a five minute conversation with my colleague about some matter. And then I go back to finish patient A's admission, but I forgot that I toggled to patient B for a moment to quickly place the Percocet order. So the rest of the admission orders go on to patient B instead of patient A. These are the kind of things that we heard time and time again. And I've had many opportunities to present at conferences or be on panels. And many people think that you know, wrong patient errors are caused by small fonts and, and, and issues like that. And, and, and they do contribute, um, but um, less often do people think that interruption um, is the issue and, and we found it was predominantly the problem. So this health IT safety measure um, in the US before um, measures are used by other hospitals and any national programs, they need to be endorsed by the National Quality Forum um, and, and shown to be valid and reliable and, and um, practical to, to, to implement. And so the, this wrong patient retract and reorder measure is the first health IT safety measure that was endorsed by NQF. So now that we have a, a measure, um, we were able to test interventions to try to prevent errors. So the first we studied was um, this simple idea um, in response to real error, um, we had a group of folks get together and discuss what might we do. And some folks thought we should have a simple pop-up saying, 
um, the provider or would alert the provider that just want to confirm you're about to place orders on Hermione Granger, 18 year old female in CCU bed five. Um, but there were those that thought a pop-up is not going to work. After a few days of doing this, people are going to blow by it and not even read it. And so they thought we should do something more intrusive where if you see there, there's a little field next to that middle stop sign. Sorry, it's hard to see, but it's an empty field where um, the provider would have to type in the initials, age, and gender. So Hermione Granger, HG 18F for female. Um, and the folks that favor the pop-up were concerned that this intrusive intervention was too intrusive and would slow people down and um, cause other kind of errors. So we got agreement to do a randomized trial where we randomized a third of the providers got no intervention, a third got the pop-up and the third got the more intrusive intervention. And what we found was that the pop-up reduced wrong patient errors compared to the control by 16% and the more intrusive by 41%. And we didn't get any reports of um, other adverse events. Um, there were folks thought that there would be a rebellion by requiring people to type the initials, age, and gender. They didn't do it for every order. They would do it for an order session. Once you did it and you can place whatever orders you wanted, but if you change to another patient, you'd have to do it again. So I have another grant now that we're um, studying if photos can prevent wrong patient errors, where again, we're gonna randomize providers to see photos or not using the wrong patient error measure as the outcome measure. Then I, I was hearing from the neonatologist that we have a real problem with wrong patient errors in the newborn ICU, the, the, the NICU. Um, and the issue um, was thought to be multifactorial. First of all, um, usually um, parents or often parents don't have names ready to go. And so we would use a temporary name like baby boy, baby girl, something like that. In fact, there was a study published in pediatrics um, that looked at, they, they didn't have this retractory order measure to look at, actually measure wrong patient errors. So they looked at the similarity of names in a NICU and determined that at any given time, um, this researcher, Jim Gray, felt that 50% of the children were at risk for wrong patient error because of the this like temporary name business. Um, and so we looked at the wrong patient errors in the NICU and sort of showed that they were right. If you compare it to the general um, pediatric population, there's 60% more wrong patient errors in the NICU and almost double if you look at multiples. And here's a picture um, from, a, from a hospital, a real live picture of how children are named, de-identified, but you can see all the baby boys and baby girls. So you can imagine baby boy Jones, baby boy Johnson, baby boy Jackson, how that can be confusing. And so we tested an intervention at this hospital to see, I wanted to name the children Cutie Pie and Buggy Bear. And the head of pediatrics told me, that's great, Jason, you can't do it. You can't start naming people's children for them. So we settled on using the mother's first name, like Mary's girl, Linda's girl, um, Kimberly's girl, and so forth. Um, so we'd added more distinction. And this was a simple before after study, uh, but we used the retract and reorder measures, the outcome measure, and we showed a near 40% reduction and published this in pediatrics. Um, and we, in the US, we had done a, natural, a national survey showing that, um, asking what, how children were named um, in their particular hospital. We got 40% of the NICUs in the US responded and 82% were using some temporary name like baby boy, baby girl, or boy girl, or um, infant daughter, infant son, or master and miss, something like that, but non-distinct names. Five years later, um, so after I, I, I published the study, the Joint Commission that um, regulates hospitals in the US recommended, didn't require, but recommended that hospitals do away with baby boy, baby girl, and use our intervention of the mother's first name. Um, and also, when we published the paper in pediatrics um, at the American Academy of Pediatric Conference, the editor-in-chief of pediatrics named our paper as one of the 10 most influential papers of the year saying, how often do you see an intervention that's so simple, that's so effective and recommended that everybody do it. Um, five years later, we repeated the survey to see, well, you know, did anybody sort of adopt this best practice? And it went from 82% to 70%. Um, so there was some reduction, but it wasn't significant. 
But then the um, following year, the Joint Commission, as I said, regulates hospitals in the US. They now require hospitals to use the naming convention that we came up with, or, or some distinct naming convention like, like that. They use our example as, as the example. And so I'm planning on repeating the survey again in five years, and I hope that, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it takes a regulation um, to make a difference. Uh, so um, we had another question about even after you use the mother's first name, like if you see there, this is a picture of twins, Judy's boy one and Judy's boy two, they both have the same last name of Johnson and medical record numbers are often um, given sequentially. So twins will have the identical medical record number except for one off by one number because they're born one right after the other, same last name, same first name except for one digit. So it's not hard to imagine that um, there can be confusion. So we used again the wrong patient retracting order measure and we showed exactly that, that if you see there that 3.8% um, of singletons in the NICU have a wrong patient error, but 7.9% of twins, so it almost doubles, and 13.9% um, of triplets and high order multiples. We um, did this among um, six NICUs around New York and it was interesting that the phenomenon was um, seen in all the NICUs. And, and it's exactly what you would think. If you take a set of twins, and you take one of the children, and you look at the wrong patient error between that twin and every other kid in the NICU, then it acts like they're a singleton. It's like 3.8%. And the reason why twins is almost double is exactly what you would think. All the extra errors are between the siblings. Um, this we published in JAMA Pediatrics. So now I mentioned we're doing a, a study with photographs to try to prevent wrong patient errors, but we thought going back that photos of these twins wouldn't help all that much. So we got a grant from the NIH to study if what we call pictographs will prevent wrong patient errors. So here um, a mom can choose, we, have, we had a professional illustrator um, draw over 400 of these. This is just a few of them. And so a mom can choose the purple dinosaur or the crayons um, and once um, a parent chooses one, it sort of gets checked out so we don't have five dinosaurs in the NICU at the same time. Um, and if they have twins, we encourage different categories. So if you're gonna pick a sport like a soccer ball, then pick an animal like a dinosaur. Um, and these get put um, over the isolate or, or bassinet in the NICU. And then in the EHR, just like the photos, that's a general idea. Um, and also putting them on the breast milk um, uh, to see if um, uh, see if we can also prevent wrong breast milk errors. I I was called my the head of the Children's Hospital at Columbia knew I was doing this work. We hadn't yet started the study yet, um, but he called me to say that Columbia had a woman who was pregnant with quintuplets, five babies, and he was concerned there'd be wrong patient errors because he, as I said, he knew of this work. Could I do something about it? Um, so we met with the mom and first of all, um, she was still pregnant and we asked her, do you have the names picked out? And it turns out she did. She knew the gender of all of them. She had all the names picked out. So we said, let's, for, in your case, instead of calling them baby one, two, three, four, and five, let's give them their given names. And then second, let, we weren't ready to launch this pictograph study, but we had the pictographs and we had the ability to show them, let's um, use the pictographs. Um, so in New York, one of our newspapers is the New York Post. And here's the mom with her quintuplets. It's the first quintuplets we had in 20 years. And you can see that those are the names um, that um, they were given from day one. Like if you see, there's a picture there of the bassinet with the baseball and the name Sebastian. And I'm proud to say that there was no wrong patient errors, no retract and reorder events. Um, and all five babies did quite well. Um, this is just the um, application that we're um, built to, for the moms to sort of pick the apps and then the nurse to assign them. And we're just about to pilot this and get this study going. Another um, uh, question in the US um, that we had, and I'm sure it's the same in Australia, how many records should we allow open in our EHRs? Many um, EHRs allow multiple records open the way you can have multiple browsers open in a, when you're surfing the web. And so you can see there, um, this is an older picture of Epic, and there are tabs there for patient A, patient, and patient one, patient two, patient three. Um, 
many folks fear that if you have multiple records open, you can easily confuse them and have wrong patient error. I, I wanted to get a grant to study this. So I, I first did a study um, to show the reviewers of the grant, like what's going on in the world. And it turned out, interestingly, that um, uh, for those that responded, 42% of hospitals allowed the maximum number of records open. We called it unrestricted, um, to whatever the EHR, Epic, Cerner, all scripts, and 41%, almost the identical amount restricted to one. And, and they would say they had wrong patient errors. They were concerned about wrong patient errors. And then 18% I, uh, chose two. I called it hedged, where um, they, uh, you know, really like they were concerned about efficiency and they thought uh, providers need to multitask but they were equally concerned about wrong patient errors. So they compromised it too. And the point is nobody really knew what to do. Despite the fact that nobody really knew in the US, if you've heard of meaningful use, the government giving hospitals money to try to um, uh, facilitate the adoption of electronic records, um, it's ONC or ONC that, that is the division of the US government that um, oversees sort of the IT and did meaningful use. And they recommended um, restricting to one. And then the Joint Commission, that regulatory body copied them. None of this was evidence, it's all expert opinion. So we in a hospital in the Epic EHR, we randomized providers within that hospital to either being allowed to open the maximum workspaces open, which is four, or restricting to one. So um, all the providers were randomized. And and here's the results. The using the retract and reorder error, there was no difference um, overall in the ED, inpatient, ICU, PEDS, OB, outpatient. In fact, the ED that had the highest error rate, the odds ratio was 1.00. The P was 0.96. So really no difference at all. And so um, it sort of allowed hospitals to feel more comfortable allowing multiple records open. And, and I think the issue is, like I said before, it's interruption more than multiple records open, whether you have multiple records open or not. When we had people randomized to these different groups, um, we did a survey asking about user satisfaction. And those that had multiple records open felt that the system was more efficient and had a higher user satisfaction. Um, so we didn't see a change in wrong patient errors. But by survey, we did see that the users really liked multiple records open. So um, the last topic I want to talk about before wrapping up is um, we have another grant to um, study. If we can make more of these measures, we were able to do so many studies with the wrong patient error measure. Our theory was that we could make more with this general uh, schema here that if you see the um, there's this sort of pool of orders. And sometimes people will, after placing the orders, they'll cancel them within a half hour. Um, and there's a presumption that many of those that they cancel, they're canceled because they realize they made an error. And if we see what they do next, we can identify the type of error and have a very specific measure. So if I order on patient A, cancel, and then order on patient B, that's the wrong patient error measure that we discussed. But what if I order on patient A 10 milligrams of morphine, cancel, and then order back on patient A 1 milligram of morphine? So I'm not changing the patient. I'm not changing the drug. I'm just changing the dose. Or what if I order one medication, uh, same dose, but I change the route or the frequency, or same patient, but I change the drug. So that was the idea. And so here at my hospital, um, we place 21 million orders a year, and you could see 385,000 times they're canceled within 30 minutes. 112,000 um, those that are canceled are reordered with some element being, being changed. Um, uh, and, and then we break this down by medications and non-medications. So of the 21 million orders, 5 million are medications, 15 million non. And so if you look at the medications, there's um, 5 million um, orders, 259,000 are canceled, and 85,000 are, are, are reordered again. And I point that out because I break that down further. So that this 85,567 is the same as the bottom here, but we break it down 20,000 times somebody changed the dose, 12,000 times they changed the frequency, 5,000 the route, and so forth. Um, and so we set up a system, like I mentioned before, where we call people in real time and to confirm if they're, um, in fact, errors. We call 340 providers who changed the dose, 160 for frequency. Um, 
and um, they, they all prove to be effective. It, 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 we haven't finalized this. This is preliminary data and it should be finalized really in a week or two and then um, a couple of weeks to write up the papers and a couple of months to publish. So you'll see the, this data um, in print, um, I think relatively soon and some of this data may change a little bit, um, but generally speaking, um, it seems for dose change, um, it's best if you, um, if it's more than a 10% change, meaning if I order um, 30 units of insulin for somebody, cancel it and then order 31 units of insulin. Um, and you call providers and you say, was that an error? Um, we, we sort of consider that art of medicine that nobody could really differentiate if 30 or 31 units of insulin is you know, right or wrong. However, if you went from three units to 33 units. So somebody accidentally hit the three key twice and there was a tenfold difference. That's clearly an error. And, and, and that subtlety is mostly seen with dose. You know, when you change route, it's a pretty big change from oral to IV or even frequency, you know, once a day to twice or three times a day, certainly wrong patient. Um, so we notice that if you have at least a 10% change, I, like I said, the, these numbers may change a bit, but, and, and these are the positive predictor values. So the, this is a, a slightly improved wrong patient error measure. I told you earlier on, 76% were true positives. Now we got up to 81%, 86% of wrong route, 86% of wrong frequency, and 76% of wrong patient of wrong uh, dose. Um, th this is showing for the wrong dose measure um, that um, if you, this is a 10% change. We had 272 calls and the positive predictive value was 76%. If there's a three-fold change, so 300% uh, increase, we had 50 calls of that magnitude and 98% were true positive. So the bigger the change, you could see um, the more accurate it is. And there was still, you know, this is a tenfold change and there were 1,400 orders where there was a tenfold difference that was caught and corrected. In fact, this is just looking there's even a hundredfold change, even a thousand. These I think are largely decimal point changes, but there's not an insig insig insignificant number, a thousand fold change there were 224. Again, these are all self-caught, but some of these are quite scary. So finally, as before, when we call people and we ask um, if it's a wrong patient error and 70 to 80% say they are, wrong dose, wrong route, wrong frequency, we ask why, because ultimately we want to put an intervention to prevent them. And um, we use this schema from like reason and others of looking at errors and trying to understand if it's a mistake or a skill-based error, a slip or a lapse. And the highest buckets, if you see the mistakes and the skill-based errors, the mistakes are like they were planning the wrong thing from the get-go. So if it's a wrong dose error, for whatever reason, let's say it's a, a, a first-year medicine resident, the dose he was planning was the wrong dose. Um, the error was sort of in his mind, in his planning. Where a skill-based error is you have the right dose, but you, um, like I said before, hit the key an extra time and make a decimal point error. And so what's really fascinating to me is if you look at the wrong patient errors and just at the highest level, 97% were execution errors, meaning Almost always people know the patient they're trying to place orders on and then they just get interrupted and something and wind up accidentally on the wrong patient, but they, but they plan the right patient. But for dosing errors, 73% plan the wrong thing. And that could be, they just didn't have the right knowledge or the planning issue could be like, they had the right knowledge, but they didn't have the right weight or they didn't notice the renal function and it had to be adjusted. So whatever reason the plan was wrong to begin with only 25% were execution. And then, you know, we, we get into like more details of why specifically people make different errors, like what I was alluding to, weight, renal function. And we did it also for frequency, which was similar to wrong dose um, and route. And so um, all this stuff is, as I mentioned, what I'll be publishing, really writing up in the next few weeks and publishing in the next few months. So with that, I'm, I can, um, end here and I'd be very happy to um, take questions. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, um, Jason, for that for that fascinating um, talk. I, I love the simplicity of the, the methods to detect um, the errors and, and also the simplicity of the interventions. 
Um, I'll just start off um, with a quick uh, technical kind of question. So you mentioned that you kind of do a copy of the HR database to kind of interrogate. So how often is that copy? It's near real time. I don't know exactly. I think like every 15 minutes and right. uh, um, yeah. at my prior institution, it was even more frequent than that. And I would say that that is important for our method to make the phone calls in near real time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but for hospitals that don't do that, once we validate the measures and like the wrong patient error measure, other hospitals now have used it to assess interventions. And um, uh, then you can run it retrospectively for a year against non real time data. The real time data is only needed if you want to uh, make phone calls like we did. Yeah. And so I guess when you're like, you know, making um, those phone calls, um, how do so can you talk a little bit about sort of the resource needed to make those calls? Um, and then, and how do providers respond, particularly if you're calling up, you know, a junior resident versus you're calling up a consultant? Yeah, so as far as resources, the very first time I, I made the wrong patient error measure that I shared at the beginning of the talk, um, I had voluntary um, students make the call. And wrong patient is a very simple error. You know, the inquiry is about like why you place orders on the wrong patient. Um, the wrong dose one, this really subtle medical, it's a subtle medical conversation. And so ideally it would be great to have like pharmacists or residents or people with some clinical knowledge make the calls. We, I, I didn't have the ability to do that. Um, it was, um, that study was funded by a grant, but we had research coordinators um, made the call. So they would do their best to capture um, and type up uh, in detail what um, the provider said and then we had clinicians, and, you know, very often they would admit it was an error, but the subtleties and the reasons were not always um, completely understood by the coordinators, but they would um, write everything down. And then um, fellows that I had, physician fellows would review them and write it up. So I did, So if you have a grant and have funding, it could be whatever you can afford. Um, other hospitals have since tried to copy, copy me in. In fact, I was talking to someone in the UK this morning who is thinking of doing this, and they have some pharmacy um, residents that they think will make the calls. Um, that's my experience. Mm. So is there is there then a case for kind of having this on an ongoing basis? Because, I mean, you're continually making changes to the HR, you're continually, you know, you have new people rotating through the hospital, so you, you're your conditions keep or the reasons for errors may keep changing? I mean, I, I do think there's a case to be made. It, 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 we're sort of lucky that the way this is set up, um, you can interview people in near real time and really understand the mechanism of the error. And that can really inform interventions. And I mentioned that there are like over 300,000 orders that are placed and canceled within a half hour. And I think that those are mostly errors and we'll have a real high reliable EHR when people stop placing orders and feeling the need to correct them. Meaning if the, if the system is user friendly enough that we just get it right and don't need to um, you know, catch ourselves. So I feel like there's a lot of work to do to understand why we're making these errors and, and, and keep trying photos or whatever it is um, to fix them. And this is just a great mechanism to learn about the failures and, and um, to, to inform interventions. Mm, but have you kind of seen, like, looked for any differences with um, expertise, for example, like, you know, do junior residents kind of make more errors um, than more experienced people or? Um, we do notice some change. We're, we're, um, we, when we finished these measures, the only measure we had before was the wrong patient measure. And wrong patient is not, it's, as I mentioned, it's sort of like an interruption. It, mm. It's all... Um, but now that we have all these knowledge errors, we're um, planning on making a five-year database. So I mentioned we have um, 20 million orders a year. So we're gonna make a database of 100 million orders. We'll have about 200,000 errors of the types of wrong dose, wrong route, wrong frequency, wrong patient. And then we're gonna um, sort of ask of the data the exact question that you're asking. Um, is it more one type of provider, one environment? Or do people make more errors at night? Is it more dosing errors when they're tired or more wrong patient errors? Like, is it more slips or more knowledge deficits? So I'm excited to explore that, um, but we just need to finish these specifications of the measures, make our database, and then we'll be off to um, yeah. try to answer some of those questions. I mean, look, it's, it's painstaking work, but I think it's very well kind of 
worth the effort in terms of unpacking sort of the reasons for uh, the errors. Um, you, you talked a lot about kind of interruption as kind of one of the main um, sort of reasons for the wrong patient once at least like 80%. Um, and so is it, have you sort of looked at any ways to minimize interruptions or minimize their impact? Um, I, no, we brainstormed a little bit and don't have a great um, idea. Um, and so right now our interventions are more aimed at um, not letting the interruption um, allow the error to go all the way through, meaning like you may get interrupted and you may, like the narrative I said, and you may forget that you toggled, but um, if we have a photo there, that might instantly uh, make a provider realize, oh, this is not the patient I was placing orders on. So um, so we didn't stop the interruption, but we um, helped them catch it before even they placed the order just by seeing yeah. the photo. You know, the general idea with photos is that brains process photos much better than words. So the word, the name of the patient may be on the top and that might not help as much as if you're placing orders like the, the, the methadone case, if you're placing orders on a um, elderly female instead of a young male, perhaps of different ethnicity or whatever, you may even at a corner of your eye realize this is not the patient I was on. Um, I, I do think there's an opportunity to try to reduce interruptions as well, but that is, um, very complicated um, problem to try to solve. Mm -hmm. I mean, like go going to the sort of photos for a second, um, like the pictographs are great. And, and you know, like, especially when you have kids and, and you can kind of see the, the beautiful colors and the rest of it. But how do like, what are the, are there any considerations around privacy when you're depicting um, adults? Like what is the, I guess, privacy considerations in the US context and, and how do people respond, um, what providers and patients? Yeah, about, um, I saw a survey about, I think 20% of the hospitals in the US are using photos now. The photos are mainly displayed like any electronic record, like right along with very sensitive information, you know, medical information. So, but it's, so the same sort of protections that protect the lab to sort of present, protect the photo. Um, uh, um, so I, I haven't heard that um, come up. And also patients um, um, don't have to have a photo taken. It's up to them. Like we'll encourage it um, to help prevent wrong patient mm -hmm. errors, but they're entitled to refuse. Pict pictographs as well, they can refuse that as well. So, so you have um, the, the photos kind of implemented at the New York Presbyterian Hospital? Well, we're just rolling it out um, to do our randomized trial. And our intent is when the study is over, our assumption is it will work and our intent. I, I work with a colleague at the Brigham that published an article in JAMA Open just a couple months ago that you can um, see. And um, he um, used our retractory order measure of raw patient errors to show that when they rolled out photos, last so before or after study, there was, um, I think like a 25% reduction in raw patient errors. So we really believe it's gonna work, but um, in we're using Epic and Epic actually displays photos um, in two different places. Um, I will show you. Um, here we go. Where this little GK is, a photo can be displayed there as well. It's called the storyboard. Um, and then there can be a pop-up with the photo. And so we're actually doing a four-arm randomized trial where 25% of providers will get the photo in this circle only, but it's on every single screen all the time. 25% will get a pop-up when they place orders. 25% will get both in this little circle and the pop-up and 25% will get nothing. And in this way, we'll get a sense, um, um, are these things additive or maybe the pop-up isn't necessary if it's in the screen all the time. Um, so we'll um, be able to really with a randomized design, um, be able to, um, th that study that I mentioned that my friend did at the Brigham was only in the ED. We're doing it everywhere. So we're able to look at photos on labor delivery in the ICU, in the ER, on the floors, and compare these different um, places of showing photos to see um, how effective it is. So I have a question here coming in from uh, by email. Um, let's just go through this. So in the field of aged care, medic medication administration errors are a real concern um, here in Australia. 
Um, do you know if your techniques for recording er errors, so have there, has there been any experience in residential um, aged care um, solutions, uh, situations, sorry. Um, sorry, aged care like for the elderly, was that yeah, what Yeah, yeah, like care homes. Right, so, um, I, you know, what you mentioned was administration errors. Um, um, nurses, you know, generally speaking, medication errors can be um, broken down to um, making an ordering error, ordering it incorrectly, um, dispensing it from the pharmacy incorrectly, or administering it incorrectly. Um, I've only been focusing on the ordering side, and this measure, like this idea of like catching an order, canceling it, and placing it, it works in this environment. When a nurse goes to administer, you know, there's been a lot of success with barcoding to, if you barcode both the med and the wristband, um, that's shown to help. And then as far as, um, you know, uh, in my ordering errors for the elderly, uh, when I make that five-year database, that's sort of top on the list to um, look at elderly and, and pediatrics, actually, and especially dosing errors um, in children. Um, I remember uh, there was a chair of pediatrics that said that she had um, children that way, it was something like this. Um, and, and the smallest newborns, like anywhere from a thousand grams to a thousand pounds, you know, from the from an obese teenager to a tiny little newborn. And so weight-based dosing is very important for children. Mm. In the elderly, um, uh, weight also matters, but um, kidney function, like uh, once you uh, reach um, um, a geriatric age, um, there's a higher chance that your medications will need to be adjusted for kidney function, for liver function, for other things. So they're both sort of interesting and we can look to see um, at the error rate. So I'm, I'm looking forward to answering that question, but um, need a couple more, couple more weeks to set up my database and then a little bit while longer to start looking at the data. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, I think it's kind of fascinating that you're kind of doing this research sort of from within the kind of epic platform and, and no doubt like it's a commercial sort of system but then you've customized it and using it in your setting um can you talk a little bit about sort of your experience in terms of using a commercial vendor system to undertake these studies like you you know you're talking about randomizing providers so clearly you have a lot of control of the ehr to kind of do these um, interventions yeah so i've done this kind of stuff um at different hospitals in different ehrs and um Every HR seems to be different with different degrees of control. Um, for example, this study with the screen I have up now in Epic, um, we had to pay Epic $50,000 to build um, the code that allowed for the randomization, um, to your point. Um, the um, study where I mentioned we randomized when I used the Hermione Granger um, example of the pop-up versus the typing in the initials age and uh, gender, that was in a, a, a GE electronic record that no longer exists and that they allowed us the um, functionality. No, sorry, they allowed a lot of customization. So our programmer just customized it um, without any paying any special money. Um, so it, it does vary vendor to vendor for sure how much control they allow you. Um, it's part of like the world I live in. There's a lot of um, trying to figure out what you can you do and um, and, and sometimes even trying to make the impossible possible by paying fifty thousand dollars to get you know randomization built, things like that. Yeah. So I mean, I guess so. The question then is like, does Epic kind of do most of this coding stuff for you, or you do some in house and then some bits that Epic does? Well, all the measure data we do ourselves. It's pretty straightforward. The data is all. Um, regularly captured by all EHRs. Like it's a simple log of orders placed, orders canceled, yeah. who placed them, who was the patient. So the, the measures themselves have been replicated in many different EHRs um, and um, they're relatively easy to replicate. It's just like this more sophisticated um, randomization that required the coding. So um, it was in this study that I had a pay epic and in the study I shared with you when we looked at the multiple records open um, that I, I, I wanted to um, I, I wanted to know how many records were open at the time of placing an order. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I could not know that unless epic built code and I had a pay epic once again. It's the only two times I ever paid any vendor to do anything was um, epic 
for the photo study and the multiple records open. Yeah, and then how do kind of providers um, respond? Like when typically, like if you're randomizing them to one arm and like, you know, is there any risk of contamination? And they're kind of talking to each other at the water cooler, like. Um, um, in terms of well, I, 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 um, I, I, it depends. And I think that like, if you're on the wrong patient, um, you know, because you were interrupted, talking at the water cooler doesn't really help all that much. And, and, and we didn't really see a difference in the arms. And I think the same thing is true with the photos. Like it's a visual cue out of the corner of your eye, you're on the wrong patient and you may see it. And because you know the study's happening, I, I don't think it's gonna really help. However, um, uh, to your point, um, in this slide that I shared, so this was the, when we randomized people to one versus four records open, yeah. there's no difference. And here it shows you just user satisfaction. I suppose I could have said or should have said that um, those that were restricted to one, while their friends and colleagues were allowed four records open, were really kind of annoyed that they were in the one group. And so like this sort of extreme difference may have been exacerbated by the fact that like they were sort of pissed off that they were in the one group mm -hmm. as opposed to like if we if we did the same user satisfaction at one hospital on the east coast of the united states that had one another one on the west coast and they weren't talking to each other it may have been closer to the same but because they were all working in the same environment some of it might be like i'm, I'm just annoyed and so i'm gonna you know express my annoyance through the survey yeah, and I guess because you were, it's not like you were randomizing departments, there's even people within departments, right? So your colleague sort of just sitting three desks down from you could have the multiple workspaces and you couldn't. It, it, it could be, you know, one medicine team that has an intern and a resident and the intern is restricted to one and the resident have multiple records open, you know, working side by side. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it, uh, I, I've done um, lots of randomization. This is the one that I think, um, was the most sort of like frustrating um, <laughs> to those in the one group, but we had IRB approval and you know options to opt out and all that. But um, uh, and but I'm thankful for those that you know participated because now we because of they participated, we were able to publish a study in a very prestigious journal sharing that it really doesn't make a difference. And as I shared, like there was real confusion. Yeah. The world was split in half. Um, there were recommendations just on expert opinion. And so it was really like a bit of a puzzle that we were able to solve um, because of they allowed themselves to be randomized. Yeah. And I mean, how long did you run the study? Like, and like, uh, it was, I think, about a year. Wow. Okay. <laughs> because even to kind of get away with it for a year and sort of get permission to do it, like in terms of, I guess, site specific approval, uh, like, you know, getting the clinicians on board, I guess. As long as you get, I suppose, as long as people could opt out, then you're, you're giving them an out. But yeah. Yes. Um, look, it turned I, out that b b before we did this study, um, the, the hospital that we did this only allowed one record open at a time. And then so, <laughs> like the, the experiment yeah. was like four records. So opting out was sort of like going to one, which was the default. So even though we allowed them to opt out, it was sort of, and Matt, so if you can think of one was the default and then four was the experiment, that was sort of the idea. Yeah, and I guess you'd have more trouble if you were going from four to one. Um, yes. You know, at a hospital, you'd have more, I guess, people um, sort of protesting. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that probably would have been near impossible to do. Look, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating kind of journey. So I have one more question here come up. Um, the, the question is around, um, you know, you talked about pictograms and photos. Um, what about more kind of visual data supporting, um, you know, the prescription? So I guess the, the question here is intended um, at any kind of indications for wrong, you know, contraindicated medications. Like, I don't know, this patient has diabetes, so you wouldn't be prescribing this medication. Um, um, I'm participating in a grant that my friend Bruce Lambert is the PI, and so my hospital is a study site. Um, and um, his idea, and he published on this, is the, uh, exactly what the um, person asking the question is suggesting. Um, he published already, and now we're just doing a bigger study that um, if it doesn't work for all medications, but for medications that have sort of narrow um, therapeutic um, indications like 
I think the example was insulin. Um, uh, so if the if in the EHR we have problem lists, and so if you try to order insulin and the patient does not have diabetes in the problem list, you'll get an alert and you have an option of saying, would you like to add diabetes to the problem list because you're trying to order insulin, or perhaps you're on the wrong patient or it's the wrong drug. And he showed that you know often people don't update the problem list, but not infrequently they're on the wrong patient or, or wrong drug, one of those two things. And so, but, and there's a good number of medications that they've identified and, and commonly used medications, blood pressure medications, um, diabetic medications, Synthroid for hypothyroidism, where there are these narrow um, therapeutic indexes. And, and, uh, and so we do those checks. Um, and so we're doing, he had, he has done preliminary work that already showed um, that it's protective and now I'm participating in this bigger mm -hmm. study with him to further further test that. So oh, fascinating. I mean, it's great that we have so many sort of different studies kind of underway. I mean, sort of one sort of final question, um, has, how has COVID kind of impacted your research and how do you see kind of coming out of it? Like, you know, uh, in terms of, has it changed anything that you're doing um, in terms of the work? Um, well, I mean, there were practical implications like um, we were making phone calls to validate measures and we didn't call people when they were um, very busy. Um, my hospital had, you know, in, in, in New York City and Manhattan, like in April of 2020, um, there was just a very large number of COVID patients and also people were stressed as, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you understand. And we didn't think it was appropriate to call them and ask them these questions. So practically we paused. Also, um, the people helping us with Epic to set things up. We wanted to um, do a lot of things to help support COVID, new COVID order sets, um, COVID data. And so when they were helping us build interventions, they paused to go work on COVID. Um, for the most part, all that is done with and we're back to making phone calls and back to getting the support we need, even though we still have many COVID patients, um, things are, are have normalized. Uh, there are also interesting research questions um, that we're looking at, like for example, um, during the peak of COVID crisis, voluntary reported errors um, fell um, because I think people were so busy. Yeah. Um, but we think that errors actually went up because um, of the chaos and confusion, you know, just the circumstances. And so we haven't done it yet, but um, I suspect that we can use the the automated measure to show that um, um, during COVID, errors actually went up when reporting of errors yeah. went down. Um, which I think will be fascinating to show. Um, well, that's it. Otherwise, you know, it's um, sort of back to, for the most part, normal. And I think that that's the effect we had. Yeah, look, let's hope, let's hope, let's hope with the vaccine yes. that, you know, things get back to normal. And I guess for us here in Australia, it's been, you know, we've, we've literally, we, we haven't sort of, it hasn't impacted us nowhere as near as it's impacted the rest of the world. And um, you know, the position that we're in, we can't sort of wait to get back on airplanes and travel again um, is, is kind of where we're at. Um, so I, I, I would say, sorry, that um, I answered the question from my personal research, but um, obviously there was there's tons of research going on for COVID itself. Yeah. And yeah. then and then specifically for the topic of sort of health IT safety, um, COVID launched, I think, or catapulted um, uh, yeah. telemedicine. Um, to the front and it's not going away. And that um, um, it's just a new way of caring for patients. I mean, it was here, but now it's here in a very large way. And so yeah. there's a risk of diagnostic errors and other things. So there's, it's just not my area of focus, but there are people certainly looking at that. Yeah, look, and there's tons of work to be done. Um, it's the same here where, you know, we've we finally managed to get uh, reimbursement for telehealth and they sort of say, say, stay, say that it's gonna stay for a little while yet. So, um, Let's kind of uh, finish up there. Uh, I really want to thank you very much for sharing your research with us today on behalf of the Institute. Um, and we look forward to um, keeping in touch and hopefully meeting um, sometime soon. So thank you so much, Jason. Um, we'll leave it there. Um, and so from uh, the AIHI seminar series, I just want to um, alert you that the next seminar uh, we have is on the 21st of April. We have uh, Professor Siri Wig um, from uh, the University of Savanger in uh, Norway. Um, and Dr. Wig, again, we have another patient safety topic. So she's going to talk about involving patients and families um, in safety investigations, um, where uh, Norway and England have established an invest independent uh, investigation body. So uh, we 
look forward um, that with you uh, joining us um, for that session as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.